Good afternoon. This is Leslie Zolman with uh, the Census and Economic Information Center. I'm going to be facilitating this webinar. And we have um, U.S. Census Bureau that is going to be joining us. I just wanted to start off to say that um, the webinar, we are open to lots of questions. So if you have anything that you would like to comment on or questions for Pauline or Jim, uh, your phones by default are on mute. But if you would like to press that little hand icon and raise your hand, then I will interrupt the presentation briefly and unmute you so that you can answer, you can ask the question. If you would also like to type in a question, you can do that under the questions box. And if you don't see the full Get Webinar panel like you see on the right-hand side of the screen right now, just press the orange button and it will open it up for you. So our first presenter is Pauline Nunez. She oversees the 2020 Census Community Partnership Engagement Program for the Denver region. Her mission is to increase respondent participation among the most difficult and to reach populations throughout the region. Her team engages a wide spectrum of partners, including government, nonprofit, corporate, community organizations, and they help spread the message and mobilize for the complete count. Jim Castaneri is a geographic coordinator with the U.S. Census Bureau, and he's been there since 1985. He has a bachelor's degree in geography from the University of Colorado Boulder, and he specializes in GIS application and enterprise GIS solutions. So I am going to turn it over to our presenters. Okay. Just a minute. I'm working on sharing your screen here. All right. And you should see an agenda. Okay, Pauline, so you, there you go. So you can see an agenda? I can see that. So if any of the attendees have questions or problems with that, again, um, raise your hand or type something in the question box. So you are free to go, Pauline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. And hello, Montana. We're having a sunny day in Colorado. So today's agenda is really looking at a broad brush for the decennial census, Census 2020. We're looking at some innovations for 2020. My colleague, Jim Castaneri, will be really looking at the different geographic programs as it relates to 2020 and how you as cities can prepare and counties. I will talk a little bit about our outreach goals for 2020, and then we'll just look at some next steps and the schedule. Okay. So I'm looking at this. Why we do a census. Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution. So actually this week when we had a retiring of our U.S. Census Bureau Director, John Thompson, you saw why we do a census answered a lot. And so as you can see in front of you, it is mandated by the U.S. Constitution. And the next slide shows that we conduct a decennial census and it has been taken every decade since 1790 as mandated by the Constitution and it really provides an important tally that helps to determine how many House seats are apportioned to each state in Congress, how congressional districts are drawn, and most important for many communities, besides representation, of course, is how federal funds are distributed. I really like to comment that one of the newspapers I read for this week that was covering the whole retirement of our director, when it said that it represents a gold standard, the census represents a gold standard for statistical data collected by the federal government one that other federal agencies, as well as businesses, 
and various organizations around the country rely on for an accurate snapshot of the American people. And as you can see here in this slide, we have a lot of other things such as informing organizational decisions and enforcing voting rights and civil rights legislation. Apportionment. This is really important to Montana. So what you see on the screen is in the 2010 official results. And for our region, Arizona, at the time we had Nevada, Texas, which we acquired, and Utah, all gained congressional seats. That's what that represents. As we look forward, we ourselves, the Census Bureau does not do those projections, but other agencies do. And the election data services published the following in December 2016. It looks like in our region, Arizona may gain one or two seats, Colorado one seat, Montana possibly on the bubble for one seat, and Texas three or four seats. So a complete count to get you another uh, congressional representative. So as we move forward to looking how are we going to conduct the 2020 census, there's some very important areas of innovation. We're looking at building a more efficient address list, easier ways for the public to respond, better use of the information we already have, like the use of administrative records, and much more efficient field operations. So the big, big news for those of us in community outreach and all over is that Communities, public, individuals will be able to respond to the census by internet and by phone. So we will be including the internet as a response option, as well as the ability for someone to call our toll-free number and give an interview over the phone. And what's also very important is that the internet and phone will be available in a number of different languages other than English and Spanish. But of course, I know there's a lot of sectors of Montana that are rural, uh, as well as Colorado and all the West. Those that do not respond via the internet or live in an area with poor internet response will also be given the option to respond on paper. And everyone who does not self-respond, we will visit in person and collect the information. And we have one question. Can I interrupt you just real quick here? Absolutely, yeah. So, Joe, you should be um, unmuted if you want to ask your question now. Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Okay, um, I, I, you mentioned that Montana was on the bubble for a, uh, a congressional district. I was wondering how close to the uh, bubble we are. <laughs> how close to the bubble you are. I know it depends on a lot of things, but I was just... Uh, <laughs> My perception really of the gap has been widening and not, not narrowing, so I was, I was oh. uh, got my attention. Well, wait a minute. The gap narrowing as far as um, it so seems that, 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 that since uh, 1990, we have gotten that when we, when we uh, lost our district, uh -huh. uh, we, when we were extremely close to how many, uh, you know, just several thousand uh, citizens uh, that was the difference. But it just seems that it's it's successive uh, censuses that the we we were you know many more thousands away from it and, uh, and it just seems to be growing rather than narrowing. So if it's uh, going the other way, I'd like to know about it. <laughs> well, from what what my information tells me is uh -huh. that uh, your what it means by being on the bubble is that depending on your population, by the time we reach 2020 that you're, you know, right on the edge for, for getting a seat and because of your growth. Well, that's good news. Good. We think so because we always like our states to gain. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So how, does the, how will the questionnaire look? And this is very important to us when we're doing outreach is to make sure that the public knows what questions exactly are asked on our questionnaire. It will be pretty much the same type of questionnaire. We are looking at each question, and one of the questions that have been 
looked at for tweaking is the race and origin. But there's nothing definite yet. We right now have just a sample of the questionnaire. But as you know, our social economic data is collected, was collected in 2000 with the long form. But now that information is collected on an annual basis with the American Community Survey. So again, for 2020, we're looking at 10 questions, 10 minutes, hopefully. And why I mentioned that in our outreach efforts as far as we actually will have copies of questionnaires for the public because I know that I worked in 2010 in uh, New Mexico and which has, and Arizona, which have a lot of seniors. And unfortunately, seniors are targeted. So we wanted to make sure that um, they knew, you know, that we are not asking for social security numbers or what have you. And these are the questions that we do ask. So that's a real important part of of our outreach is to have the questionnaire handy and, and make sure that everyone communicates as to what questions are on there and what are we asking them. So the other big news is that we really stepped into the 21st century as far as field operations. In previous census, believe it or not, the entire process, data collection and management, was conducted by paper and pencil. And we had to rely on daily in-person meetings with field staff and have no ability for real-time communication. So we tested a process in the last two tests, one of which I was involved with in Arizona. So we had a control and for the old-fashioned way we were doing the census and the new, fashion, the new way with automation. And so from those tests, we can see that we are going to gain a lot of efficiency by automating things like recruiting, training, and payroll. And also what's really great is that field workers will be able to use handheld devices for collecting the data. And we have technology that's similar to like UPS drivers or even some political campaigns have used where you can track a person's caseload and really design it so that it's only that those cases that they need. And also, we will be able to track to make sure that the field worker is, is where they need to be in collecting the data. So a lot more efficient 2020 census. So key data collection dates. So from now to 2019, in our Jefferson, Indiana Processing Center, we're using the latest techniques, images and local sources, and the staff is determining areas which are stable and do not need boots on the ground to visit them. And they're looking at growth areas, revitalization of neighborhoods, and so where we will need to canvas with census listers. So at this point, we're looking at probably having to field visit between 25 and 30 percent, and in the last information I heard, it's more looking like 30 percent of all blocks in the U.S. So this limited work in the field will also be a cost saving over previous censuses where we canvassed every road in the country. So January, excuse me, April 2018 is when our regional census center opens and we will have a regional census center in Dallas, Texas. Well, actually in Arlington, which is between Fort Worth and Dallas, Texas. Spring and summer 2019, we will have early area census offices open. And for Montana, that will be in Billings, Montana. And that will be the only area office that will be open for the census. It will be in Billings. Because again, we are uh, getting efficiencies from this whole automation. So August to October 2019, we will have address canvassing in select areas. Fall 2019, area census offices are open, but we will already have the Billings, Montana office open. Early 2020, which is very important for communities throughout Montana, is that we will start our group quarters count where we will have relationships with military bases, with college dormitories, nursing homes to look at how we count the group quarters, as well as the homeless population. 
Now on March 23rd, 2020, in 2010, that was a big deal. I remember for our region, I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and our director was there uh, in downtown Phoenix to launch out the mail out campaign. Well, you see that it's changed, that we're calling it self-response. So that's when we're going to flip the switch and have everybody be able to respond by internet, also by phone. So it'll be a much broader beginning for 2020 and a different one. So April 1st, 2020 remains Census Day. May 2020 is when our non-response follow-up starts. And that's really critical that, again, in outreach efforts, that we let cities and communities throughout know that timing because we want to make sure that people know in their communities when we're out there uh, collecting information and we have boots on the ground. That's real important, especially we collaborate with law enforcement and all that so that they know we do have people out there and our purpose is to collect the census. So August 2020, our data collection should be complete, and December 31st, 2020, all counts are delivered to the president. So I'm going to pause for just a minute. Are there any questions on that piece? And if you think of something later on, you can go ahead and ask it, no problem. So I'm going to turn this over to Jim Castaneri, our geographer because geography is the foundation of the census. So he's going to give you a whole overview. Jim? Thanks, Pauline. And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Jim Castanari. I'm a geographer here in Denver. As you heard, I'm going to take a little bit of time today to talk to you about a couple of geographic programs that affect the outcome of the decennial census. Um, and as Pauline suggested, geography being that foundation of the census process, there are a few programs that we want to talk with you about to uh, provide you information and an opportunity to participate. Before I jump into those programs, let me take a minute to describe a little bit about geography and what geographers at census have been up to over the last decade or so as we progress toward 2020. A primary goal and activity of geographers such as myself is the maintenance of our address list. Certainly the Census Bureau has maintained an address list for over 20 years. It was used as part of the 2010 Census, and since 1994 we've been supplementing our address list with the U.S. Postal Service's delivery sequence file. Uh, over the last decade or so, we've also supplemented our address list with information from tribal, state, and local government officials in the form of address lists, GIS data showing road center lines and so forth. We've also been working in-house identifying areas of change using imagery, um, those address lists I mentioned and matching those with the delivery sequence file and the tiger file to determine where we're detecting change and differences. Since about 2012, 2013, we've been conducting a new version of address canvassing where staff in our offices at Jeffersonville, Indiana are looking at change at the block level, uh, again, using local data, imagery, and other sources, we're looking at where the address list is significantly different from 2010 and now. Where we're finding significant differences, we're attempting to update our address list, and where we are unable to update that information in the office, we are designating those areas, those census blocks, as part of our field data operation, field data collect operation, or our address canvassing operation to be conducted in 2019. And then the 
The big player in town at the moment is our local update of census addresses, or LUCA, on that purple arrow, arrow you see there. Um, the LUCA program is something I'm going to talk about here for a few minutes. What is LUCA? The local update of census addresses is an opportunity for state, local, and tribal governments to review those lists of addresses that the Census Bureau has which we use to conduct the decennial census. It is most efficient for the Census Bureau to mail. In the past, it's been a questionnaire. For 2020, we'll be mailing an ID card to as many addresses as we can. Those ID cards have been geocoded, tagged to a place on the ground. And the respondents will have an opportunity to go online, as Pauline mentioned, and respond to the census that way, make a phone call, and have a, a, an operator take their information right on the phone. And in some cases, if they request a questionnaire, we can actually mail a paper questionnaire to that address. So the LUCA program is key, a key component, that is, to maintaining an accurate address list. Why, as a local government, should you participate in LUCA? Well, certainly, Having access to our address list allows you to ensure that we have an accurate list. Do we have all of the addresses for your government? And being able to review that list ahead of time allows you to ensure that we do. So a little bit of background. I mentioned a moment ago that the LUCA program was authorized by the Address List Improvement Act of 1994. Not only did that authorize the Bureau to share our address list, which are confidential, by the way, just like your responses to the census and other surveys, those are confidential. The addresses are protected by Title 13, the U.S. Code that authorizes the census itself. That Address List Improvement Act allowed us not only to share that list with those governments that sign a non-disclosure agreement, but it also required that the post office provide their delivery sequence file to the Census Bureau on a regular basis. So not only did it establish the LUCA program, but it kind of built this um, process by which the post office fed addresses to the Census Bureau, the Census Bureau attempts to geocode that information, among other sources, and then once a decade when LUCA rolls around, it provides us the opportunity to show you those addresses to see if we have them correct. So we did roll out LUCA for 2000 census, we refined it for 2010, and we're offering it again for the 2020 census. Now, we are required by law to offer the LUCA program to all governments across the United States. Participation is totally voluntary. I want to make sure you're cl we're clear on that point. If you choose to participate in the program by signing up, we're going to announce it officially in July. Today I'm promoting the, the uh, program. If you choose to participate come July, then we will have our confidentiality agreement for you to sign. This essentially says that the address information we provide as part of the LUCA program are covered under U.S. Code Title 13. Not only does it require the Census Bureau to ensure that we treat information confidentially, but it also requires that all liaisons and reviewers, local officials participating in LUCA, also treat that information with confidential uh, handling. So what's new or what's different about LUCA for the 2020 census. A couple of things, if, if you're a geographer at heart, a GIS person, or anyone who deals with addresses, these are some interesting differences. Um, we are going to provide, if you sign up for LUCA as part of the product um, suite, we're going to provide those ungeocoded addresses that came to us from the U.S. Post Office's delivery sequence file. Now, because we don't know where they are below the county level, we can only provide that list of addresses to counties and state and the state if it chooses to participate. If you choose to participate in the program, it's going to require that you submit individual within-unit identifiers. 
such as apartment one, unit A2, um, unit 3001, et cetera. In the past, we didn't require that information, and it put a very large burden on our field listers to try to find those units when we were in a large multi-unit structure. For 2020, it also will include the structure coordinates for those addresses we have, and for those on the phone who have worked with the Census Bureau over the years to exchange this kind of information, much as this information was acquired through that program for those that relationship we've had with the state of Montana. The LUCA program also allows local participants to provide that information back to us, and they can provide them for non-city style addresses. We conduct the census primarily using mailable tools, whether it's a postcard or a questionnaire, whether we're in the field finding an address, but we will allow local governments to submit an address location in, in the form, I should say, a housing unit location in the form of a coordinate, even, even if it has a non-city style address. That will help us in the field locate those addresses when census day comes. So who can participate in LUCA? All federal, federally recognized tribes that have reservation or trust lands. The state of Montana can participate. Any county in the state any incorporated place, and I should point out that councils of governments or other quasi-governmental agencies can participate if an official government agency designates them as their liaison. So having said a mouthful about LUCA already, um, what information can we provide you to help you decide whether this is something you want to do when it rolls out in July? Here's one thing. We have produced for the first time in the history of the Census Bureau an address count list generated in January of this year. So this is, this is not an individual list of addresses. It's just a count by 2010 census block that you can look at to compare to your address information to decide if we have the correct number of addresses in any given census block. And you can find this information at the bottom of our LUCA webpage, which is shown on the URL there on the slide in front of you. You have to scroll down to the bottom and you'll find a little drop down list there on that website. There's an option to download the entire state, a whole county, or an individual jurisdiction within a county and tribal government as well. Here's another tool that you have at your disposal. It's the Census Geocoder. This has been around for three or four years, I suppose. We've made some updates to it recently. This tool, if you're not familiar with geocoding, allows you to post an address, a city style address, to a tool that's online and have it return a latitude longitude for that address or a piece of census geography. It also allows you to submit a batch, a file, if you will, a comma separated values file of a series of addresses, up to 10,000 of them, to see if we can locate those addresses on the ground. And the URL for that service is shown there on the slide as well. There is also a help file on that website if you have trouble. And then later on in the presentation, we'll provide my contact information if you have more difficulties with that process. So for LUCA, there are three ways you can participate. There is our GUPS software, our Geographic Update Partnership software. This is based on QGIS, an open source but quite powerful Windows-based and Linux-based GIS system. We have added some tools through a contractor to make it specific in its flavor for the LUCA program. And you'll find if you work through us throughout the decade on the census process that we also use QGIS for some of the other programs I'll mention in a minute. We realize, of course, that many governments have their own GIS software, so you'll be able to request an address list and a shape file from us without the software and perform all of those updates using your own in-house GIS. And lastly, for very small governments, less 
those with fewer than 6,000 addresses, you can request a paper process. We'll send out very large paper maps and your list of addresses on sheets and sheets of paper. It's quite a bit of material, trust me, we used to do it this way in the old days, and you really don't want that unless you absolutely have to, but we do make it available. All right, so if Luca sounds like something you might want to do, here's what you need to know. You can prepare now, get your ducks in a row, if you will, for the program by looking at some of those tools I mentioned, the geocoder and the block count list. Be ready to register come July. We're going to do another mailing um, as an official invitation. What we sent out before, many of you have probably seen it already, was a promotional mailing, and it had a form in that a package that allowed you to identify an individual that we should mail to come July. So that was simply a promotional outreach, and that's essentially what I'm doing now, talking with you all today. In July, we'll mail again. Once again, we're required by law to do this. We're required to announce it and offer it to you. It is optional. You are not required to participate. It's an optional opportunity for you. We think it's beneficial if you do, and so we want to make sure you have all the information you need to make that decision. If you decide to participate in July, and you have between July and December 15th, I say July, it's around the 1st of July, we'll mail those out, but by December 15th that uh, open door will close. The minute you sign up, you can start thinking about a technical workshop. We'll provide that in a variety of ways. There will also be computer-based training associated with the GUPS software, and um, there will no doubt be webinars and other forms of help available to you. We have an 800 number that's online now for those who are interested to provide help and assistance as you move through the LUCA program. If you do sign up, um, we will generate the products and send them to you starting in February of 2018. Once you receive the materials, you will have 120 calendar days to complete your review and get it back to the Bureau. The reason we have to put those strict time frames on there is that we've got um, tens of thousands of governments that we're inviting across the country, all at the same time frame, and if we gave too much time available to everybody, we would never get it processed on our end. So there's a key issue here with this program, with the LUCA program and the next program that I'm going to talk about, and that's the BAS. So let's look at these dates real briefly. In January, we sent out the advance notice saying, hey, this thing's coming. We sent it to the highest elected officials, tribal chairs and governors. In March, we started talking about this program. You may have heard of LUCA before in other places. I'm talking today about it. In July of this year, we're going to send the official invitation. In October, we'll start doing technical workshops, and by December, that window will close for registration. Um, we'll ship products to those who sign up in February of 2018, and then there'll be a feedback period in August of 2019. Now, I mentioned another program, and that's the Boundary and Annexation Survey, the BAS. This ties in with LUCA, for this year, for 2017, because when we generate the LUCA products for those who sign up for the program, we generate those products based on the boundary that we know about. The BAS program is an annual survey of all governments to collect the legal boundaries that are in, fact, in effect as of January 1st of that year. Now we have had a memorandum of understanding with Montana for a while now on the boundary issue. So it's my hope and expectation that the boundaries for all of the governments in the state are accurate. But it's really imperative that you ensure we do have the latest annexations for your government before we generate those LUCA products. If you can imagine a large uh, subdivision that has been annexed recently for your government, and that information didn't make it to the Census Bureau as part of the BAS program, when we go to generate the LUCA products, we're going to use the old boundary, and it wouldn't necessarily include that new annexation. So check if 
your bath has been included, and I'll tell you how to do that in just a minute. Um, certainly the boundaries are not just important for LUCA, but we use the boundaries to tabulate the data for the decennial census. That's how we know how many people live in Billings, Montana, um, in any place in the country. They're also critical for our economic censuses, our population estimates program, and the ever more popular American Community Survey, or ACS. So the schedule of the bath is such, yes. We have one question, if I can interrupt sure. you. Leanne, I'm going to unmute you if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Leanne. Okay, maybe no question. I'll keep going, Jim. Thanks. Sure. <laughs> Not a problem. So for Bass, there is a submission schedule. If you submit your Bass changes to the Bureau by March 1st of each survey year, that information is reflected in the tabulations for the POP Estimates Program and the American Community Survey product. If you get your BAS changes to us by May 31st of each year, then that information is reflected in the following year's BAS. And I get this question quite a bit, actually. People will say, Jim, I sent the BAS in last year, and I got the maps from you guys, and it doesn't show the changes. And then I'll say, well, when did you send them? Well, I don't remember. So I'll go in and I'll look it up, and we'll see that we received their BAS changes on June 2nd. And that would be the reason we weren't able to process it in time to reflect it for the new products. This May 31st date is also the case for the LUCA product generation this year. So those bath changes are in by May 31st, you'll get your full LUCA address list. As I mentioned before, there are some tools available for baths. One of them is that GUPS software, and this one's been out there in production for a while, and governments have been using it. If you have your own internal GIS software, you can provide BAS changes through some procedures we have published on the web. And I have a, a URL listed for you later on. You can also participate via paper maps. Again, that option is for very small governments. So how do you know what your boundary is like? Do we have the right boundary now? That URL at the bottom of the screen is one way to find out. Tiger Web is an interactive tool that allows you to display the current boundary for your jurisdiction within your web browser. So once you open that URL, if you open the mapping application, you'll get a window of layers on the left side, and if you browse through those list of layers, you'll find incorporated places. You turn that on and zoom in. You can turn on roads, you can turn on imagery, and you can verify that we have that correct boundary. Okay, Jim, I'm going to interrupt you again. I, I found the question. So for the 2010 census, there were many census blocks that had no access. Looking at the blocks, the boundaries used were cow trails, streams, irrigation. Is there a way that census blocks could be determined by legal roads in frontier count communities? It's also a safety issue when sending personnel out into the unpopulated areas. That's a really good question, and it's a it's a challenge we've had at Census for for more than ten years. I can tell you that. And Montana is is no different than other states in the West and some places in the East as well. And to answer your question, um, that is continues to be a challenge for us. The Census block algorithm is an automated algorithm that occurs after we define the census tracts, this program that I'm just about to talk about now. Once we define the container that is a census tract and the block groups within that census tract, the computer automatically defines census blocks based on a set criteria. The criteria is primarily those features that are visible in nature. Even though we have the technology now to deal with all kinds of different boundaries, we still prefer and rate uh, highest those features that are visible. 
roads, streams, um, major features that don't tend to change. Now, because we tabulate data both for statistical entities and for political entities, those blocks can be split by non-visible things, the public land survey system, an annexation, a fire district, any number of these things, a school district, for example, uh, any number of these things could split a block based on the delineation that was done by the local government or entity designing those uh, boundaries. Many of those boundaries are non-visible. They might follow a parcel boundary. They might follow who knows what. It is our obligation to use those splits in Tiger to make sure that the blocks observe those boundaries. I shouldn't suggest with that statement that all of those features are the result of local government data. There are many cases where Tiger has spurious boundaries in them, and in those cases we try to limit that. We go through processes by which we try to limit very small polygons um, that occur due to the topological rule set of the Tiger system. We actually have the block boundary suggestion program that is part of the redistricting data program, and that process state organizations can look at features and decide which ones should and should not be block boundaries. Um, even the PSAP that I'm going to talk about now provides an opportunity to refine that which defines a block boundary. In, the, in a nutshell, we try to reduce those concerns you mentioned, those spurious features that make nonsensical block boundaries, but they still tend to pop up. Uh, from time to time. So we're doing our best to get rid of them, and I hope it looks better for you this time. The blocks are new every 10 years based on those containers for which now I'm going to talk about. The 2020 Participant Statistical Aries Program, those of you who are involved with E911 know that the use of the term PSAP is not such a good term. Uh, I think we had it first, but um, my vote is to change it just to the TRAC program. This is an opportunity for regional planners, uh, councils of governments, to review those statistical entities, census tracts, block groups, and CDPs that can serve as data containers for the 2020 census data tabulation and subsequent publication in 2021. We're going to reach out and encourage regional planning commissions and councils to participate in this program and ask them to solicit input from the community so that we have the best statistical plan available for the dissemination of the 2020 data and the ACS data in future years. We will offer this program for both uh, tribal governments and non-tribal governments. Here is the schedule for the PSAP, the TRACT program. Um, it will be in two phases, like the LUCA program. There will be a delineation phase that begins uh, in late 2018 and a verification phase in late 2019. Let's see, did I miss something there? Uh, I think... Well, uh, I it didn't mention that the participation option in here. The tools for the TRAC program, unfortunately, will be limited to the GUPS software. Whereas in other programs, you are um, allowed to use your in-house GIS. For the TRAC program, we are going to distribute a software package called the GUPS. I mentioned it before, where you will manipulate the TRAC boundaries within that package. For regional planning agencies, they might define that plan for multiple counties. We'll reach out to individual counties where they have no representative planning agencies. And we may even contact the state or even the CEIC for help on some counties that need representation for a good track plan. The last small program I want to talk about today is the Boundary Validation Program. This thing is a one in 10 year effort. It's separate, sounds a lot like BAS, and it is, but it's separate from the BAS for a reason. When we tabulate the data for the 2020 census, it's done that tabulation 
is conducted based on the geographic boundaries found in our digital mapping system, TIGER. We conduct the BAS every year to make sure that we get the best boundaries we can, but we found that we really need to do this boundary validation program in January of the decennial year. We mail out a notice to the highest elected official and say, hey, mayor, commissioner, we are getting ready to tabulate the census. Please make sure we have the boundaries correct for your government. So it's yet one more effort on our part to reach out to all of the governments and say, do we have the right boundaries before we publish that ever important number for population and housing come December 31st in the following year for the state level information. So some last comments for you if you're interested in some of these programs. Um, for LUCA, for example, you can check out our LUCA website. You can try out our geocoder at that URL there. If you are interested in the PSAP program, reach out to your local planning agencies, contact them, and ask if they're going to represent you for PSAP. Um, we have some handouts that were made available to you all today. There is one um, entitled Road to 2020 Census Key Geographic Partnership Dates. It's got some dates on there for some of the programs I mentioned. And at the bottom of that sheet, says for more information, you can reach Denver Geography, and that's my department. Our phone number is 720-962-3880. Then we have a, an email address as well, Denver, it's kind of simple actually, denver.geography at census.gov. You can call or email to those numbers and we will get back to you within a day, usually. Um, I can take further questions. If there aren't any, I'm going to turn it back over to Pauline to wrap us up for the day. And if there are no questions, thank you all for your time. Pauline. Jim, Jim this is Leslie. There aren't any questions, but I wanted to just make a comment. So on the GoToWebinar, you guys should have a little section for handouts. All, there are five handouts. Unfortunately, the one that Jim just mentioned is not included in there because we maxed out on, on the fact we can only put five in there. But I will be sending an email that has links to all those handouts. You should have also received one yesterday in your reminder email. Um, and you can always contact me if you didn't get it one way or another. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. And I just wanted to do a shout out to Leslie. I've worked with many state data centers throughout our 12 state region, and all our states have a great network and have all been helping us as we are launching the 2020 census. So thank you, Leslie. Thanks. Okay. How did you go forward? Try clicking. Clicking. Just okay. click once and then it worked for me. Okay. I'm going to try arrow down now. No arrow down. Okay. I'm just having some um, frozen PowerPoint. <laughs> there it goes. Oops. How you can prepare okay. this one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Hold on a second. We're just having some technical difficulties, of course. Um, no. Okay. Maybe that way. Maybe the this wheel. way. Hmm? The wheel. The wheel. It says, uh, I don't know why it went. Hold on a second. We're just, it's funny to go to the end. Hmm. Yeah, and Pauline, I can show it on, on my screen if you guys can't get it working. Okay, we might have to go to that. For some reason, it's... Yeah, it's not... Responding. Okay, let me, I'll, I'll switch okay. presenters and show it, and you can just tell me when you want me to change the pages. Okay. Then. Well, yeah, it is, it's no biggie. <laughs> okay, just let me know when. Okay, just a second. Sure. So hang in there with us.
So 20 years ago, we sent a man to the moon, and we're still having trouble with technical work. <laughs> technical work. Okay, here we go. There we are. So, um, there, okay. Should it work now? Yes, and so you're going to forward the slides for me, correct? Yes, okay. just let me know when. All right. So I just wanted to give you an overview of what it's looking like for us to be doing outreach for 2020. So the program for outreach is called Community Partnership and Engagement Program. Last census, we called it the Partnership Program. And so for the last two censuses, this has been a critical part of us conducting the census and to engaging partners throughout the country, and of course for us it's the 12 state region. And in 2010, we pulled together about 250, 100,000 partners from throughout the country to spread that message about the importance of participation in their communities. And so a tip, uh, some partners or typical partners were around the spectrum of government, local governments, like those of you who are online, nonprofits, corporations, and community organizations. And all of these partners and faith-based organizations help spread the message and mobilize their constituents to support the goal of a complete count. Next slide. So the goals and challenges of, of outreach of community engagement is first of all, motivate people to self-respondents, I should edit it and say self-respond, because the more people we have uh, doing a self-response to the questionnaire, the less boots on the ground and less non-response follow-up we have to do, which is a huge savings. And also, when more people self-respond, it tends to be a more accurate census. Another goal, as well as the challenge, is that we want to assure respondents that their data are confidential and secure. And in these times when people are reading about hacks and, you know, for personal information, identity theft, that's a real challenge and we will continue to be a challenge as we move forward to the 2020. As we said before, we wanted to we want to educate people about the importance of participating in the census. And as you saw before in the earlier slides, we talked about that it determines your representation in Congress, also state legislature, as well as federal funding for your communities. And so that will impact your community for the next 10 years. And I can tell you from doing data training for several years, the numbers are so important as far as population estimates are based on the census 2010. So just have to educate. That's one of our challenges, educating the communities about how important it is for them to participate. And as we saw in Montana, that uh, you're on the bubble. So we've got to really push those Montana folks to fill out their census. The last thing is, support communities in their mobilization efforts. So we will have a team of partnership specialists that will be out in different communities working with governments, nonprofits, community-based organizations, faith-based to help mobilize communities in Montana. Next slide. So this slide simply shows a partnership that occurs, one with the census with communities. On the left side, it talks about what we bring to the table. One is, of course, having partnership specialists in each state, having tribal specialists, which we have two on board at this moment. We also have an ongoing data dissemination effort that uh, provides data training. We also support local efforts and are right now learning about the Complete Count program and what it will entail for 2020. We have a national media contract, and we will have national partnerships, and of course those wonderful promotional items that all communities love to use to promote the census. The most important thing that a community can bring are trusted voices, because it is one thing for us to come to your community and say, oh, please participate in the census. 
but it is so much different and I've experienced it in three or four different states that I worked in in that when I was at a faith-based community and working with religious leaders if they said please participate in this it was so much more powerful or for uh, in a city council meeting for the council or the mayor to come before the constituents and say we really need to have a complete count in our city we are asking communities to help us form the complete count committees which were successful strategies in 2010 we're going to use them again and of course your communities bring local resources for a very strategic and uh, customized promotion in your area next slide so this configuration here is an outline so to speak of a state complete count program in 2017 our goal is for all of our 12 states that includes montana is to contact your state leadership your your governor or a designee of your governor to talk about how the state will prepare for 2020 and so by the end of the fiscal year we will have contacted each of the governor's offices in our region because we want state leadership to say yes we want to be involved and we want to go forward next slide and at this point we're right now looking at training the trainer and what will be the complete count committee structure in the future and so we will probably be pressing more upon this from 2018 on but again we will be looking at cities and uh, community organizations as well as tribal nations as well as county uh, commissioners or county governments to form complete count committees because it is a formal process where a city government or a county government or tribal will actually pass a resolution to say yes we're going to have a complete count committee and the, these are the representation that will be on the complete count committee to make sure that all sectors of our community are involved next slide and this just shows a slide of some of the um, participation of course we always include children in uh, the complete not in the complete count but in outreach because we think that in many communities in the Denver region there are young families and um, especially for example on the border and so we we will be reaching out to also school districts transit authorities etc next slide and this slide media and advertising reminds me of the huge contract that was laid out for to promote the 2020 census and we will have an advertising campaign but part of the two-edged sword I refer to is social media we will be using social media and all of those of you online know that social media can be a two-edged sword because on the one hand like when I was working with 2015 test we used uh, city councilors uh, congressional reps Facebook pages to promote what we were doing and also to let city neighborhoods know that we would be out uh, in their neighborhoods collecting data for the test census so that's that's great because it is a good way to alert people from throughout a community about an event or about what's happening but on the other side of social media is it can things go viral or negative so that's going to be a huge challenge and so we hope to work with communities in Montana to meet the challenge and make sure that we get a complete count in Montana so final slide critical next steps so I encourage and you to follow the direction of Jim and our geography department to please participate in local update of census addresses this is a critical year for that we want you to consider what you may want to invest as local funding for 2020 as you can see there's much at stake so investment for the future is important finally think about state local and tribal complete count programs like I said 
Right now, we're looking at the strategy behind that for 2020. I know it will be a very data-driven strategy. We are going to be looking on the track level to see what are communities throughout our 12-state region that have hard-to-reach, hard-to-count populations and have some strategies around that. Questions or comments? Will Montana be ready for 2020? Okay, I see a hand up being out there. So again, there's that number for Denver geography. And actually our geographers are very friendly people, so make sure you give them a call. And also the email if you have some questions that come up. I know there's a deadline coming up at the end of this month. And so make sure that you contact us. Leslie? Yes, um, I'm going to uh, unmute everyone if we want to have some question and answer time just to talk back and forth. So if you have not muted your phone and you don't want us to hear that, do that soon and I will unmute everyone. Oh, I think. So now is the time if anybody has questions or we want to discuss. Do you guys have any questions? No. Okay, Pauline, maybe we don't have very many questions. Oh, we do. Joe has a question. Okay, Joe, I unmuted uh, you now. Yep. Uh, Pauline, uh, is, is there a some sort of a memo or report that, that does has, has uh, projections for which states may be gaining or uh, losing uh, uh, seats in the in as a result of the 2020 census that you were referencing earlier? Okay, sorry, Colleen, and my okay. <laughs> I turned you off. So go, go ahead and answer. I thought so because I thought that I was muted. Uh, probably not a bad idea. But as I was answering the uh, question, I have set it to search space. for a full address, and I have set all and? fields to contains rather than equals because in the long run, I know my deputies won't know the exact spelling on some of our roads. That question? I'm Sorry, muted. somebody else was talking, so I, <laughs> go ahead, Pauline. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. This is part of the fun of a webinar. So um, to answer your question, I don't have a website readily available, but I can get it for you. Just email me so I can email you back. My, e my email is Pauline, P-A-U-L-I-N-E, dot uh -huh. Nunez. Did you get that, Pauline, dot N-U-N-E-Z? Yep, right. At census.gov. Census. And I have a colleague that I know I can ask for that. Okay, thank you, Pauline. I appreciate that. Sure, absolutely. Anybody else? Chris, you have your hand up also if you wanted to ask a question. Yes, I'm wondering if these slides will be available uh, so we can share them and help uh, our organizations understand the schedule and the purpose of this work. Yes, um, we are both recording this webinar and it will be posted on our website and the slides will be available also. Is that correct, Colleen? Am I able to post the Yes, slides? yes, yes, yes. Okay. A big so yes. yes. They will all be done, and I will email you guys once that's done, um, along with the links to the other handouts. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess that's all of our questions for today. Thank you very much, um, Pauline. Thank and you. Pauline. It was awesome. And um, yeah, we look forward to talking to you guys again. Okay, Montana, get ready. Take care now.
Thanks, Thanks. Leslie. Bye.